In my previous video, I responded to Flat Earther Tenth Man and his insistence that I debunk his cited sources. I obliged and showed that all of his sources actually disagree with him. And in fact, the panel's entire sextant narrative is built on a curved adjacent straw man resting on an incorrect redefinition of elevation angles that is contradicted by those same sources. In short, their citation-based flat earth celestial navigation argument is just a massive exercise in confirmation bias. But that was just the first half of that video. I went on to do something they've never done in their two years of constant chanting about celestial navigation. I actually demonstrated a position fix, including showing how the underlying geometry is entirely globe-based. And while Tenth and others did react to my video in a recent Flat Earth debate show, it was limited to complaining about my handling of their citations, completely avoiding any discussion of the demonstration that drove the final nail in the coffin of their narrative. Perhaps they would have gotten to that eventually, but show host Nathan Oakley made it very clear he would not link, show, or review any part of my video, saying I could only make my case live on the show. But then had me banned from his server, making that impossible. And can you really blame him, considering how devastating that video is to their claims? But at least one panel member was brave enough to provide some feedback. Brian's Logic commented directly to my YouTube channel, rejecting my demonstration because I had not drawn my circles of equal altitude on a flat surface. The fact that they nonetheless intersected at the correct latitude-longitude coordinates somehow bouncing right off of his cognitive filters. This excuse for rejecting the evidence of his own eyes is not exactly a new one. Other flat earthers have voiced variations on it, essentially arguing that my circles of equal altitude cannot be real circles because they don't meet their preconception that circles can only exist on a physical flat plane. This is sometimes dressed up with appeals to Euclid's elements and circles being defined as two-dimensional planar objects. Of course, this ignores the fact that Euclid does not preclude the plane of a circle intersecting other shapes, and it essentially discards centuries of math and geometry that builds upon Euclid, such as the well-established understanding that the intersection of a plane with a sphere yields, you guessed it, a circle. So, mired in an understanding of geometry that has not progressed beyond 300 BC, flat earthers presume anything with circle in its name must necessarily be on a flat surface, even when discussing navigation systems that were developed only a few centuries ago. This narrow view is particularly curious considering the high regard they claim to have for citations. If they really want to know what type of surface circles of equal altitude originate on, they could just consult the writings of Captain Thomas H. Sumner, the guy who invented the navigation process based on them. In his book, a New Method of Finding a Ship's Position at Sea, published in 1843, Captain Sumner lays out in considerable detail the geometry and the usage of these circles. As is the case with every single navigation text ever cited by Flat Earthers, it contradicts their claims and quite explicitly describes the Earth as a globe. For example, on page 6 in the section titled Explanation of the Principles Upon Which This Method Depends, Sumner specifically mentions the spherical surface of the Earth. In this same section, he says, common definitions relative to spherical bodies may be necessary and includes this text. Quote, if any plane or flat surface pass through the sphere, the intersection of the surface of the sphere by the plane is the circumference of a circle. End quote. So clearly, Captain Sumner agreed with the notion that circles can exist on the surface of a sphere. He also goes on to define a great circle of a sphere as one whose plane passes through the center of the sphere and, pay special attention to this, a small circle of a sphere as one whose plane does not pass through the center of the sphere and consequently divides the sphere into two unequal parts. He references these definitions on page 42, when he describes the equator as a great circle that divides the Earth into two hemispheres, which are also divided by small circles of the sphere parallel to the equator, which are called parallels of latitude. 
so named because the planes that create the circles are parallel to each other, assuring that the circumferences of the circles never touch each other. Calling the latitude circles parallels of latitude was a convention of the time, and the basis for Sumner initially using the name parallels of equal altitude for what we now call circles of equal altitude. He noted that just as latitude lines encircle the ground position of the celestial pole at ever-increasing distances, with every position on a given latitude providing the same sextant altitude angle for the northern pole star, you could create similar circles around the ground positions of other celestial bodies, with the distance from that GP following the same 60 nautical mile per degree rule. The major difference being that these circles were cocked at an angle to the latitude circles. In case you think he did not consider a parallel of equal altitude to be a circle on a sphere, he explicitly makes the point by referring to it as a small circle, which he previously defined as the circumference of a circle on the surface of a sphere. And since I know that Brian's logic will be screaming how these circles must be flat because you can't have a curved radius, I must note that nowhere in his book does Captain Sumner describe the distance from the ground position to the circumference as a flat radius. Quite the opposite. He explicitly says it is a curving arc length, just as I've always said. Specifically, on page 43, he says, quote, Each parallel of equal altitude, it will be observed, is described round the pole of illumination as a center at a distance measured on the arc of a great circle, passing through this pole, which is equal to the complement of the sun's altitude." End quote. Now the pole of illumination, in modern terms, is what we call a ground position, or GP, the point at which the luminary, in this case the sun, is directly overhead. And the complement of an altitude angle is called the co-altitude angle. So the contemporary way of saying this would be, each circle of equal altitude, it will be observed, is described round the ground position as a center at a distance measured on the arc of a great circle passing through the GP, which is equal to the sun's co-altitude. Notice that the glaring thing that needed no translation here was the term arc of a great circle, used to describe the distance from the center. So, Brian, when you insist the distance from the GP to the circumference must be a flat radius line, you are contradicting how the inventor of the process says it works. When I used the equator, which is a great circle, to measure out an arc matching the complement of the altitude angle, also known as the co-altitude, I was doing things exactly as Captain Sumner described it in that quoted passage. So I guess that means we have to shrink this list down and make room for another entry. Now, the fact that yet another source contradicts their claims is hardly surprising, considering their entire sextant narrative is built from confirmation bias on steroids, and not from any knowledge or experience that comes with actually doing celestial navigation. If you've watched my previous video, you saw how I took actual sextant angles, translated them into arc lengths representing the distance to the corresponding ground position, and then drew the circles of equal altitude, showing how they intersect at the correct coordinates. And lest you think this was a one-time fluke, I've also tested this using actual sextant angles provided by a friend who is a commercial ship captain. And sure enough, these circles intersect in the Red Sea right where they should. By the way, be sure to check out Tiny Captain's YouTube page, this is the person who provided those angles, for some excellent information on celestial navigation. When using the technique with MC Toon's $100 sextant challenge, my globe technique again hit the mark within a half degree, reproducing the same cocked hat as my manual plot. Oh, and congratulations fellow celestial navigation enthusiast Bacon on winning that challenge, and also on the amazing celestial navigation software you create. Finally, I also tested the globe using sextant sites from accomplished sailor and navigator David Birch. As documented in his book, Hawaii by Sextant. These sites were actually used in a challenge on MC Toon's channel, link provided in this video's description. And again, drawing the circles on a globe nailed the correct coordinates to within a half degree, both for latitude and longitude. Just for fun, I also tested it on a flat map, specifically a Gleason azimuthal equidistant projection, the map that at least for a while was considered by many flat earthers to be the flat earth map 
and it was off by about 450 nautical miles. Any flat world map will give similar bad results, because all flat maps distort and cannot provide a consistent, accurate distance scale. In order to get accurate results on flat paper, you have to use the spherical trigonometry of sight reduction to zoom into a small portion of the globe to reduce the effects of curvature, converting those curved lines to flat tangents. And yes, I do promise to cover sight reduction in an upcoming video. But for now, let's just review what we've learned in this video. Nobody on the Flat Earth debate panel has ever done any celestial navigation, despite two years of talking about it. Faced with an actual demonstration of the process, they mostly ran from it, instead falling back on their already debunked citation-based argument. The only response any of them could muster was Brian's logic complaining that my circles of equal altitude were not drawn on a flat surface, even though Captain Sumner, the guy who pioneered their use, clearly described his circles as being on the surface of a globe-shaped Earth. So once again, the authoritative sources disagree with you causing your citation-based narrative to completely collapse. My demonstration of celestial navigation finishes the job, rolling the corpse of your argument into its coffin and pounding in the final nails. And while you will no doubt refuse to recognize that painful fact... No, that's not dead, it's uh, resting. Resting? Yeah, resting. Everyone else can clearly see that your flat-earth sexton argument is really and truly dead. It's stone dead.